Go. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Park and Rec Commission for the Town of Needham for Tuesday, June 9th at 7.14 p.m. Before we start our meeting, I'd like to go over the uh, speech I have to do as a preliminary matter. This is Christopher John Gerstel, Sr., Park and Rec Commission Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Commissioner Cindy Chaston. Yes. Commissioner Matt Tulin. Yes. Commissioner Michelle Geddes. Yes. And until he is sworn in, it will be Commissioner Bruce Williams. Yes. All right, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Director Stacy Mulroy. Yes. Assistant Director Angela O'Connor. Yes. Administrative Specialist Kristen Wright. Here. All right. Uh, anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond. We don't actually have any speakers tonight, correct? So we don't need to do that one. All right. Good evening. This is open meeting for the Needham Park and Rec Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and such the governor's order suspend the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in publicly accessible physical locations. Furthermore, further, all members of the public bodies are allowed to encourage to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. Scroll the next page. For this meeting, the Park and Rec Commission is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to share your screen of your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supportive materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along with the using the posted agenda unless chairs, the chair's notes otherwise. We are now turning the first item on the agenda, but before we do, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker of the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of the members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any reason or for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. For items of public comments, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and address only. Once the chair has list all the public commenters, commentators, excuse me, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. That is all I have. All right, let us go to the agenda for the meeting. Let's jump into the director's report, please. Um, thanks, Chris. There's just a quick summary on the director's report. Um, as far as COVID, we are in our first phase of the SOP return to work, which basically means that each of us are in the office one day a week. Um, and the rest of the time we are working on office duties remotely. Um, however, we are also down on the lower level of the RRC or out at the fields um, more frequently than we have in the last few weeks. Um, so we are downstairs working on programming for the summer season. Parks and forestry, um, as you guys well know, we are doing a field phase rollout um, and in your director's report, does everybody have access to the director's report? 
looking at it as we speak. Excellent. Um, so those are the phases. Summer programming, which is also a discussion item later in, on the agenda, but the quick summary here is that the all of our original summer programs as advertised will not be run as advertised as they do not may no longer fit within the recommended guidelines from the state. Uh, we are working with public health to come up with some new summer protocols under the guidelines. That is also true for the pool programs. All of our pool programs have been canceled. Um, we are unable this summer to run swim team or swim lessons. Um, and we are working with, again, public health to um, come up with some new pro protocols for any anticipated pool opening. And lastly is the Rosemary Dredging Project and the report is attached if anybody has any questions. I'd actually like to kind of jump back if you don't mind in regards to the fields and I want to kind of take a run around the commission. I know I'm lucky enough that for work wise I can drive around see some of the fields. There have been certain days that I have seen everybody on the fields when there are people adhering to the guidelines and I know I can't be at every field at every single time but the days that I do drive around I also do see people adhering to the policy. I'd like to hear from some of the other commissioners or even the staff. Have you seen this? Have you seen people abusing the policy? Give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, Commissioner Chaston. Uh, I haven't seen any problem. Um, I have been around a little. I haven't gone. Um, into the Fazio, but I've driven around by the other parks. I have not seen problems, but I can't say that I have looked that hard. I have not gotten out of my car. So, but I have not seen any problems. I haven't seen big groups. Um, I make my husband drive me around. Whenever we're out, I make him stop by any field that we're going by. And it's like, no, no, that looks like a dad and a son. And so, um, anyway, I have not seen any problems. So I've been pretty pleased, but I'm thinking the staff is looking more closely than I am. Sure, Tulin, have you had a chance to drive around or see any of the fields? Yeah, I haven't seen anything egregious. I know um, small groups of people are doing things appropriately from what I understand from talking with neighbors and others, but nothing egregious. Okay. So Mr. Chair, if I may, yes. a quick Zoom tip for all participants. If you just hold down the space bar that will mute and unmute you, so you can be on mute and then when you want to speak, just press down the space bar so you don't have to try and find your mute button all the time. Not working for Cindy. <laughs> Cindy's been technologically challenged all day. That, that doesn't work on my iPad. It doesn't work on my computer either. No, it doesn't. It, no, maybe it'd work on my laptop, but it doesn't work on the iPad, which is what I'm on tonight. But if you have another tip, I'm, I'm willing to try anything. Maybe maybe if you or do, if you have the Zoom app downloaded, that might also help instead of viewing it through the web. If you're if you're going through Zoom over the web, that may not work. But if you're using the Zoom app, it might that might be the difference. I don't know. Michelle ha or Commissioner Gettys, have you seen anything that has been egregious? No, I I've experienced the track, which I think was working very well. Um, and then there were just you know pockets of more aged kids at DeFazio kind of playing, but nothing that was out of okay. the Great to hear. All right, let's hear it from the staff. Stacy. Uh, quick question for Michelle. How is the tape? Is it still down on the track or is that long gone? I did not, I did that, not really see it. Answers my question. Answers that question. Just wondering. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, I have not seen anything egregious. Uh, my biggest concerns are the things that we're not seeing, mm. um, which we can't control and what I'm hearing is there's a lot of people are breaking the old rules of where dogs can and cannot be on and or off leash. It's, it's not so much the 10 people or less or non-organized sports, it's the dog situation, which 
it is what it is, but that is what I'm hearing about more. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Kristen or Angela? We'll go Angela first, then Kristen, if that's okay. I haven't noticed anything outrageous. People are socially distancing, wearing their mask. They're just glad to be outdoors. And I don't blame them. Love it. Kristen. Uh, short of the 14 people playing catch football last night at Memorial, not really anything else. <laughs> Very good. Bruce, just to kind of keep you aware of that, with the rollout phase that we had for the fields, is that we do not want any organized sports teams as of now on the fields. This is for passive recreation, for families to get out there. Now, listen, if you want to go play catch with your son or daughter or something along those lines, we welcome that. But just no organized sports teams on the fields at this time until we can make it into another phase. Um, so that's one of kind of the things that we were afraid of is that someone would look at this as, oh, it's perfect time to have a team practice because the fields are open. Um, right. Only thing that I've seen and heard, or excuse me, I've heard, haven't seen is people giving tennis lessons at the tennis courts. Yeah. So, um, but again, you know, can't be everywhere. It's hearsay and, you know, I, I don't want to say it's hard to not think that happens because we all know it does. But I mean, if, if that's the most egregious thing I've heard, that's not that bad. So, all right. Um, that is until somebody gets hurt. That is not yes. covered under liability insurance because the lessons are not run through us. So. That Correct. is a concern, and yes, they mm -hmm. are happening. We're just trying to police it as much as we possibly can. Exactly. So um, the only other thing I had in regards to the director's report is, boy, am I glad to see this is probably the last time we'll see the Rosemary Dredging Project on our director's report. Um, I know I took a drive by. I think it looks fantastic in regards to what they recouped and redid. Um, I know in the report that was sent out by Angela, we have beautiful new stairs on Chambers Cove. Uh, from what I saw, it looks like it was put back to the original way or better. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any comments, but I just, I, I'm glad the project is over. I think it did a great job. They were able to get more of the waste out of the bottom of the, uh, of Rosemary. So to have that taken out and have it go back to its natural state, I, I thank them and glad to see this is probably the last time they're on the report. I have to agree with that. The water looks so clean. When I was driving by and I went in um, last week just watching the water come in, it's not as murky and as, mm -hmm. as dirty as it used to be. And it's just because they're refilling it, but it's definitely, yeah. definitely more clear and pretty. Got it. All right. Perfect. All right. Anything else in regards to the director's report? All right, not seeing any. Let's go on to the program report. Angela, you are up. So um, another calendar was put out with the collaboration of the library, Needham Youth and Family Services, and the CAF, as you can see on page two. Um, and then our activity bags, the collaboration with Needham Housing, um, Kathy Pinkham at the, at the schools, um, Sarah Shine at Youth and Family Services. Um, we started registration yesterday. Um, as of noontime, I think we had two, I mean seven, and we had one donation already. Um, and I don't know, Kristen, if you, do you have sportsmen at home that you could be able to bring that up? Um, which I'm really excited about because it's only been a day and we're getting that out. Um, we are looking into doing drive-ins, but financially we have to figure that out with the bids and all of that stuff. And with, um, you know, possibly opening the pool and doing programs, we need to kind of figure out what we're going to do, um, before we move forward with booking everything. Um, some are hiring and interviewing are, um, are going to happen hopefully moving forward soon. Um, but that's what we'll be talking about later. Um, still working on virtual, going virtual with the capability of transitioning to regular programming if we, um, if we decide to go in that direction. Um, 
we had a meeting with building maintenance and it was positive. They were super happy to support us in any way possible um, for whatever um, facility we needed. And they would, Barry and Cecilia were more than happy to help us make whatever we needed to have happen, happen. Um, we received a layout for um, the parking at Memorial Field um, to potentially move arts in the park from the field space to the parking lot. And then um, the Tom Newtold band and Robert Clark are not performing this summer. Um, Robert Clark is just gonna move over to next year and it'll probably be same with the other band. And that's all I got. And then uh, the flyer that went out for the activity bags. I'm gonna jump in on that. Mm -hmm. um, Chris and I beat you to it. Those are the same numbers that we still have for the activity bags. I was okay. just not being rude and letting her finish. <laughs> I let her finish. Um, and oh. the, on the drive-in situation, we were really pushing for um, a June drive-in. We were really trying to get that going. Um, but with the uh, plethora of guidelines and protocols, uh, we are switching our focus back over to programs and pools. Um, to get those underway before we add in an event like a drive-in. We are still going to push for that, but it's probably going to be more like a July and or an August situation as opposed to a June, because I think right now the staff, the department needs to focus on what we can do moving forward. Commissioner Tulin. Hit the space bar. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. I appreciate the update. I do think and I agree with where your focus is. Um, it'd be nice if maybe it's not necessarily a one and done. I think one of the things about the drive-in is that it can roll into the fall, right? As I'm sure you guys have all covered, but you could do a replacement for arts in the park that rolls into the fall a little bit, you know, as a possible option. So I, I do think the prioritization's right, but just keeping in mind that we may be able to do more. I agree. I think it'll be very successful. Um, what we found out is, for the cost, if we try and roll too many in at the same time, it hits, it hits our procurement number. Um, so we were trying to figure that out and then the protocols came in. So I think actually we are gonna try and figure something out for like July, August, September, and maybe even October um, because I think there's a lot of interest in it and I think it'll be good for the community, but we're gonna just shift for now and then roll back to that. Kristen and then I have a comment, Kristen. Um, so we, like they said, we are still looking at procurement and um, we're still, it's not a, a halt effort, it's a slowed effort. So we can be prepared more for, for July. Um, and I think that it's going to be well, well liked by the community. And also, you know, to if we do one and see how it actually functions, um, that will give us a better impression of how we can continue it on. My only question, and I, I think it's been kind of back channeled, where would we look to do this? I know Memorial was probably where social media wanted it, but just practicality, I would want to think of a bigger location, either like a like a Newman or a Tefazio to put something like that. Is that what we were thinking or is Memorial back on the on the docket? We were Memorial. thinking about your house, actually. Which side, the East Wing or the West Wing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Memorial is um, only for the arts and the parks. Thing okay. if we were to do that. The Fazio is the location that we're looking at for the drive-in. Okay, no, good. Uh, I figured Newman, the better. I went there because they were concerned about the trees in the parking lot, and I didn't realize that there were trees until I actually drove around it, even though I've been there quite a few times. <laughs> and there are trees <laughs> in the parking lot. Yes, they are. Don't say that to the <laughs> conservation committee. They'll come after you. <laughs> so those trees are a little little bit in the way. Well, we can, we have time to work on that. Um, <laughs> Bruce, I saw, were you trying to say something or are you just making a comment? I was just saying use both wings. Oh, of course. Property, you know. Put it right in the middle, but perfect. Yeah. So, all right. Anything else or any other further comment in regards to the program report? All right, not seeing anybody. Thank you what? for that, Angela. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, let's jump into the meat potatoes here. Discussion items. Uh, let's start off with number uh, number one. Letter A, the pool. I know, Stacy, you had sent out some preliminary numbers yesterday. Uh, so let's kind of get into the jumping around here and see what we can discuss about the pool. There is a reason why I lettered them and I did not number them. I'm no fool. A, A number one. Um, so as you guys all know, and I'm sure you've combed through the very thorough guidelines of Twice. the school and the camp. Well, the camp you had to because they updated them six day, seven days after they posted them. Um, and then the, the playgrounds and the splash pads were the third one. So we'll, we can start with the pool. I guess what I want to start out with saying is like, we have options to open. Um, we can do things within the protocols. There are like, if we can make the best laid plans on paper. Um, so I guess I just want to start by saying that because I am hearing that we definitely want to do something. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Because well, we then we can just put this away and I can go on to the next thing. But oh, keep it out. Okay. Um, so the staff uh, uh, for this one, Angela and Devin did a lot of the, the legwork and I cobbled it together. So Ange, you may need to jump in on this at some point. Um, but what we ran through is three different options. We did a morning lap swim, a morning and evening lap swim, and then a morning and afternoon slash evening, a morning lap swim, excuse me, and an afternoon slash evening family swim. Um, and that is in the document that, um, that we worked on. And so within the guidelines, for a morning lap swim, we can get roughly 40 people per day for a 7 to 1230. And that's using 10 lanes, eight of them swimming, two of them walking, four time slots. Um, the time slots being roughly 45 minutes with some time in between to disinfect and clean before the next group of people come in. Um, so that's option one. Option two is similar with a break in the middle of the day and lap swimming in the evening as well for people that would prefer to swim after work or later in the day. Um, lap swimming seems very straightforward, very doable, uh, very manageable for both the staff and the members visiting. It's like it's pretty straightforward. We would open it up uh, you would register for a time slot. We would say you're in lane two, you're in lane four. However, that works. Half of them would get off out of the pool on one side and the other even lanes get out of the pool on the other side. Um, and it is fairly straightforward. Um, and we can go into some of the other de de details about the pool if you wish, but I'm going to just focus on like the actual swimming part. So like I said, lap swim, very straightforward, very manageable. Um, and very safe for the staff or, or safer for the staff. Uh, one of the things for the staff, the lifeguards, they will have to, they will be required to wear a mask at all times unless they are doing a rescue. So on chair, off chair, doesn't matter. They will be required um, largely because, because of the protocols and the guidelines, but also because we want our staff to mimic we want our staff to create the behavior that our members will mimic. Um, so that is lap swimming. When you bring in family swim, things get a little trickier. Um, a, we're bringing in kids and they're tricky. Um, B, so what we've come up with in, Angela, I'm not sure who gave us the overlay, but somebody from the town, correct? Of the, the space. Overlay for the uh, the spaces that we can put families in yeah but what devin and i and tara the assistant director from health and human service or the health department have talked about is divvying the the pool up for family swim and numbering it one through whatever mm -hmm. and those numbers those same numbers would be the same number that they would sit at so we would divide the tiers up into sections so like say one through seven so 
and we would make sure that you know if they're going say section one is you know in the area by the the slide since we're not opening the slides the family could go down into that slide well and swim in that little area and their place would probably be closest to those stairs so they're not intermingling with people and it will be one way coming in through the tunnel and onto the tier and if you wanted to circle back around you would actually have to walk all the way around the pool in a one way um a one way path um that's what Devin and I and Tara had discussed um, to make it as simplistic as we possibly could um, for people to get in and out of the pool mm -hmm. and still enjoy their time. So the family slots would be broken up into longer slots so they would be roughly an hour and a half with more time in between for cleaning then the lap swimmers have about 15 minutes per block in between for cleaning and the Family swim would have slightly more than that because we would naturally have to clean more areas because there would be more than 10 people. We can get roughly 12 families per time slot. Um, and we made the space big enough for six people in a family. Um, so that if we open five days a week, that is 180 families per week. Um, and then when you just go by the numbers, you're gonna get around a thousand families per, for the whole summer, depending on, I use an, an average of four weeks that we might be open to be conservative. Um, but say we open for four weeks and we have a thousand families per week, that is. Thousand? Not a thousand. <laughs> not a thousand families, sorry thousand people per week that would be four thousand people for the summer am i going too fast because i'm missing my own notes you got it okay so for the family swim for and then it, so that's what it would look like logistically in the pool people would register for a time slot they would come they would be there for an hour and a half they would not be able to bring very much with them and then they would have to leave then we would clean and then the next people come in. okay it is doable absolutely no problems what we have to consider is when it comes to registration we have to make registration as equitable as possible okay how are we suggesting that oh we haven't gotten that far <laughs> we're just thinking equitability um just that we leave 20 percent of it opened um for people to be able to register either 20 to 30 percent to allow scholarship or housing to be able to register for those slots okay so one of the things that i want us to think about as a as a group is lap swim manageable we can get people in get people out family swim manageable a little bit trickier we have to come up with some spaces and some areas for them to get in if we open for four weeks we're going to get each family is going to be able to if if we really truly do it equitably equ equal Equable. thank you equitably it's going to be one family will be able to register for one time for the whole summer if that so I think we, we, that is the conversation that like, I think is, is super important to have. It is totally managed, like it is manageable. We can do it. There's lots of protocols, but we have to factor in that some families may only, most families will only ever get into this pool one time this whole summer. Stacey, are you basing that on the number of passes that we've already sold and doing that, breaking it down that way? No, we're basing that, um, we're basing that on if we filled 12 families, 
each time slot, three time slots per day during the five day week, that that's what it comes out to. We're not basing it on what we have already, um, simply because a lot of people aren't registering for memberships um, because they, they didn't know. So that seemed like an unfair number to, to reach at. Uh, we did look at the numbers last year to see if we could break down the number of people that we served um, in Needham. I'm sorry, I'm still not following how you're getting your denominator. So what, what is the baseline of when you say one family available? Are you trying to base it on total households or total people? I, what, how, where, how are you calculating that number? What is the actual math? For a thousand people, or are you talking about how many? Where I'm coming? When you're saying one family? family will get access to Family Swim for the entire summer over a four-week period, what? How are you calculating that? It's less of an official calculation, to be fair. What I'm saying is, if we have twenty-three thousand people in Needham, and we had how many Needham members last year, Kristen? How many family passes, Kristen, did we sell? 450? This year. How many family passes are sold right now? She's pulling it up right now. Because Stacy, it doesn't go by total families because not everybody plays, right? And yes, we do have walk-in passes, but we really should be looking at those that either had family passes last year or registered some way, shape or form. We can understand. I know we had 40,000 visitors across the entire summer, right? So this is a substantial lowering of that, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's why I'm saying we shouldn't be looking at the total population of Needham as our denominator here. Okay. We should look at what we sold. Exactly. She doesn't like that number. Me or Kristen? No, oh, I don't Kristen. like that sportsman just crashed. Hold on one second. No worries. That, uh, it could be more than a second, <laughs> to be fair. Um, okay, well, let's put that particular conversation on hold while Kristen does that. Um, it is, you're right. It, we can't go by the total population. My thought process is because everything else has been on hold, we may get more families because of lack of travel and more people home and um, sleepaway camps that have been canceled, that we may get more families. But. Not 23,000. No, 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 not 23,000. I'm just saying there is I don't know how often somebody is going to be able to come to the pool with their family. So our members are typically used to coming four or five days a week, typically, not all of them, but some of them, I would assume. Yes. So Stacy, I agree. Get the space bar. Matt, you're muted. Sorry, wrong application. Uh, just do the math the other way. If you're saying a thousand people, divided by six, right? Then, and then you say, so that I think it was. All right, let's all do this exercise. 166. Thanks. So, and then you multiply that times your four weeks. So that's 100. That's 166 families per week if you just start with 1,000 people, mm -hmm. right? That's, that, fair. that's a fair number of families. I, I understand that we have to accommodate and account for the different travel patterns and people not being able to go away and different things like that. Those are factors and considerations, but we're still reaching 166 families a week. Let, that's not including the lap swim, which you know I think may even be in higher demand because I know nobody's been able to swim and every swimmer who swims for exercise is looking for some sort of outreach. Um, but, you know, so you're, you're looking in the neighborhood of, you know, almost 
you know, several hundred families will be able to be addressed by doing family swim at some point in time. And 667. Thanks, Chris. So that's a fair number of families that will be impacted positively by us doing this. Still pulling up. So, hey, two here we go. We got some live numbers. I was, I was racing the clock of you guys talking. Um, 2018, we sold 1,155 memberships across the family, individual, and senior categories, including both residential. Um, I'm only looking at residents because residents are the only ones yep. coming into the pool this year. Um, residential early bird and residential regular season. Um, that also includes the 2018 numbers that rolled. What if we just do, just do 2019? If you are 2020, excuse me. 2020. At this point in time, we have sold one. I'm sorry, we have sold 287 memberships. Um, if we were to announce that we were limiting or uh, eliminating early membership, I would think that that member would probably increase drastically. And secondly, I think that if we um, advertised that members would have prior priority to register over non-members, that that number may also increase, especially since it is inclusive of the 2021 season. All right. Just taking some notes here. Any questions, comments, like, uh, please, this is, is going to be a very open. Sorry, Kristen, are you finished? Or Sorry, you I, one, I just one more thing. Since we announced that we were extending it to the 2021 season, we have seen an increase of approximately 60 memberships. Six zero or 16? Six zero. Six zero. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sure. All right. Commissioner Chaston, you raised your hand. What do you have? Uh, I, I have a a lot of questions, um, but let me start. So let me confirm, Kristen, we've sold 287 memberships for this year? Yes. 287, okay. That doesn't seem like that much to me. What if we stop selling memberships? We, we could consider that. I'm just gonna throw that out there. We don't have to talk about it, but that may be something um, that we think about. And what if we have families of four people instead of six people because I'm looking at you know my family I have two kids uh Chris has two children Matt has two children Michelle does Bruce I don't know about you um Stacy I don't know if you have two or three you yeah so you you you're you're over the average of the uh, of the department um but I'm maybe that's something and, and Kristen has got a zero up there right well you've got time <laughs> Um, so maybe we would want to think about those people, you know, I, I don't know how many, I, I have a lot of friends with three and four children, but maybe the families are smaller. That's one thought. We could service a few more people. If we can figure that out. Hold, hold that thought, Stacey. Maybe it's too difficult. And if it is, I understand. Um, I'm one, I, if we can go back to the lap swim, because I think the lap swim, you're right, is, is much easier to address. It's straightforward. It's, it's most likely adults, right? There's no kids involved, at least no little kids. Um, 45 minutes for a lap swim. What if we reduce that to 30 minutes? Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I used to swim, but I was never a master swimmer or any of that thing, that kind of thing. So maybe 30 minutes would fly and then we could get more people in. Um, and we need 15 minutes between those lap swims. And maybe we do, I don't know if that's in the regulations. And if we need that, that's fine. Um, and my other question is, are we using both pools for that? So we're using the swimming as well as the, the walking is in the family pool, right? Okay. Uh, but maybe the 30 minutes would get us more people in. Um, and I think that's just such an easier one to manage the whole lap swim. Um, and then how long will it take? I have a bunch of questions. We get them all at once. Okay, I'm trying to take car. notes here. Recorded. So okay. We can hit rewind. How long will it take to clean between um, families? It sounds like 15 minutes perhaps between the lap swimmer groups, but how long between the families? Um, and lastly, for right now, Angela's point about leaving 20% for scholarship or housing, I don't understand 
what that means, but I would be, I would just like to understand that. I'd be happy to do that if it's something that, um, that sounds like it's reasonable. And that's it for right now. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll start with the six people versus four people. Um, we were coming up with the spaces on out of the water that could accommodate six people um, because it would be, I think it's easier to fit four or six people in the same space, but if we have, if we have to change the spaces where there's some spots that are only four people and some spots that are six people, then it makes the registration process much more difficult uh, and it gets gummed up in the works. Um, and then we're gonna get some people probably that have five people, but say they have small kids try and register for a four person spot. So we were trying to make the spots manageable and make them all the same size. That being said, we are open to suggestions on it, but that's where we were coming from that. Um, and what I'm assuming is we're going to ask for people to register for a slot, whether or not they're in the same family is up to them. And so like, if you have two families of three people that are already, you know, have broken their social distancing barrier, then they, then it's up to them to choose to purchase that slot. So that's where we were going to give people some wiggle room, I believe. Angela, is that where you guys were thinking? Four. Sorry. For the 12, yeah. for the six people versus the four people average space. For each space. Mm -hmm. um, actually, each space in the lap pool, you can have up to 10, 10 people because that's the guidelines. Um, so if you're cutting off that area, as long as a family is together, that amount, that family can all hang out in that group, but then they have to be six feet socially distanced from everybody else. So you could have six people in a family in that section, or you could have 10, um, but you can't go over 10 because the group of 10 is... Wait, is that in the water or out of the water? It's in the water. So, but it has to be the same. It's got to be that family, only that family. So if you have a family of, if you have a family of eight kids, um, but then we would have to make sure that they were socially distance and kind of travel as a group. Kind of like the camp protocols and the camp guidelines that they have put out. If you're in that group, you have to stay within that group. So if you're in the water, you can be in the water in that section with those 10 people, but you can't meander throughout the pool. So you're just in that section playing within your family. If that makes sense. Does that make sense to you guys? Chris, you look like you're like, wait, what? Oh, I <laughs> just picturing this in my head. So basically um, we are drawing circles or whatever areas on the lawn and we are we're going to delineate spaces in the water so your group of six has to play in this square of water and you can't go outside of it enjoy and how big is the square it's pretty decent size our pools are big so we have a mm -hmm. lot of area to cover um it's you know, when Devin and I were looking at how we were going to split stuff up and walked around the decking and just kind of looked at stuff, there's plenty of space to put 10 people in the spaces that we would be in. It's, I mean, you can play Marco Polo in those little spaces with your family or whatever, um, but you can't just, you'll be restricted to that area. You, you can't go to any other area. I have questions at the end, but I'm going to go to Commissioner Tool and so, uh, sorry, Cindy, you'll go after. You've already, you've already asked a bunch of questions. He had the floor, Cindy. I think. I cede the floor to Ms. Chast. I, I was just hoping to get some more answers to my questions, but as long as Stacy answers them before we leave tonight, I'm okay. Oh, yeah. Sure. 
I'm totally. I'm sorry. You're right. It. Let's okay, we go. I'm sorry. I got distracted. Let's go back to Commissioner Chaston's questions. Okay. So that is the. I apologize. That is the discussion on the four versus six people. Moving on to the 30 minutes versus the 45 minutes. Our kid swim team practices, or most of them are 45 minutes long. Mm -hmm. Our master swimmers will have my head if I tell them they can only swim for 30 minutes. Um, I, I think that typically like an exercise regimen of any kind, if you go to a gym or you go for a run or you whatever is typically around 45 minutes. Um, um, and on just so on that point, when you mentioned like it will be mostly adults. However, if a child can pass a swim test and they will be swimming laps alone, not floating in their floaty behind their parents swimming laps, but then they can absolutely register. So and we're thinking a lot of our swim team kids that we just canceled their season on will maybe want to swim. And, and I, I'm sympathetic to that. I definitely understand the, that they want to swim for longer, but these are not normal times and maybe in the interest of giving more people an opportunity to swim laps, they're limited to 30 minutes. And if we find that the slots don't fill up, then maybe we, we could adjust. I mean, that's what this whole stuff is about, right? Is adjusting or what's the favorite word now? We're pivoting, everybody's pivoting. Um, but maybe we could adjust. I'm just thinking if we did 30 minutes, um, you, you could get a number of more swimmers into the water. And maybe that's what we have to do this year. And, and even though people might like 45 minutes, maybe they don't get it. So I'm, I'm just throwing out, I'm thinking about how to support most people in the time we have, that's all. I think also um, with the cleaning and all that stuff, I think as time goes on and we pick up, you know, the pick up how to clean and how to move through all this stuff, I think that we'll be able to shorten the cleaning time um, to be able to access more time for swimmers, if that makes sense. Because right now this is all brand new to us. We know, we know what we need to do, but how to execute it is a whole different story. And when we do go to execute it, how we're giving ourselves the most amount of time that people have been saying, recommending to us. But if we're able to do that within, you know, within 15 minutes instead of the half an hour that we have, that would be able to help us tremendously in the long run. And the stuff that they've come out with, um, the cleaning supplies and the sanitation, um, a lot of it is spray down stuff and it literally only takes a minute to sanitize. So if we can really look at what we need in order to open the facility and you know do the cleaning piece and really get down a plan and a checklist of how to make this happen efficiently, we'd be able to cut that time down so we could we could get more people in. I definitely agree with Angela on that. One of the other things that I want to put into place early on, because like she said, you know, we've got these protocols on paper. We've none of us, nobody in the Commonwealth has done this in practice. And one of the things that I know from running a pool for so many years is it's not easy to get people to leave in a timely fashion. They get out of the pool, they want to dry off, they want to rinse, and we can't let anybody in until every last person leaves. For the lap swimmers, it'll be a little bit easier because they'll come with their towel, their bathing suit, they'll swim, they'll leave. For the families, it's, you know, you know, they'll be corralling all of their people and trying to get their stuff and leave in a timely fashion. And every last person has to leave before we can let the next group in. Um, so that's why those in between periods are lengthier than perhaps they need to be for now until not just we get the protocol down, but our members get the protocol down. Okay. I mean, I, I would still put for the 30 minutes for the lap swimmers and say this is what we have. And if we can adjust, we will. Um, I, and I don't know where people are swimming these days because I don't know what's open. So we will get master swimmers, but we will get people who just want to swim who may do you know, 15 or 20 laps and be done. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I anyway, I, I would err on serving as many as we can this summer, but that's, that's my two cents. Um, I, won't, I won't keep the floor um, 
any longer. What was your you third know? question, Cindy? Um, well, it was about the 20% of the, I think the space that Angela was saying, she, she was recommending that we leave available for scholarships and housing. I'm not quite sure what she means by that and how yeah, that would so what would happen is when people register, we'll make sure that there's certain blocks that are blocked off for people that don't have internet access, that can't get on the phone or that can get on the phone, but can't, you know, really register, don't have the ability to do that. So those blocks would be, would be um, put aside for people that have, you know, the issues that they're not able, they're not able to do. And, you know, it might be for seniors or it might be for somebody that doesn't have the funds to be able to have internet or get online or anything like that. Okay. So would hypothetically say no, nobody calls up for those spots. Mm -hmm. Would we then make those spots available for other people or would, okay. Cause yeah. <laughs> I don't want an empty spots. No, I want right. to make do that. <laughs> You know, that, yeah, try explaining that, like, oh, I'm sorry, we have to keep that open just in case. Yeah. We would basically hold them open until a certain time frame and then okay. open them up to the public. Okay. We can collect the waitlist. Commissioner Toulin, if that's all right, Commissioner Chast. Thanks. So I, I just had a couple of questions. One's probably a nitty detail, but also follows on with obviously we have to figure out the process for registration and prioritization and criteria and all that. Um, I would also suspect that if we are, or let me ask it, let me ask the question first. Are we only planning to use the lab pool or are we using both pools? Both. So the plan is both. So we would use certainly for lap swim, we would use the eight lanes and then the two walking lanes are in the other pool, correct? Family correct. pool, we call family. it. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Family pool. So we would use those for lap swim. During family swim, if we went if we move forward with that, we would be using both pools for that as well. Yeah, because I think the other thing to think through whether we want to do it or not is a whole different discussion, but I would also think that some families with small fam some families with small children may want to use only the zero entry areas or reserve particular areas of the pool um, because so, of they're accommodating that. Go ahead, Angela. You're ready. To, you're already <laughs> already thought through that. <laughs> so Devin and I had talked about that already, and when during registration period, we'd like to put in the depth of the pool area um, so people are aware of how deep they're swimming in um, because we don't really want be, you know people that can't aren't comfortable swimming swimming in the diving well or you know swimming in the deep end so we're going to try to you know note that when they're registering and i would imagine we were going to do that for the lap swimmers too like you're going to register for lane eight i'm going to register for lane four especially since we know our master swimmers have their favorite lanes um yeah. and some of our other swimmers would prefer to be next to a wall um so people would register for a specific lane okay and then um my Kristen, only you other... must be thrilled to hear all this yeah mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, I just, and then the other, other thing, right, we would not, what if there's a water walking lane, so if a senior wanted to use a water walking lane for water walking, they would know that they would have a water walking lane, not a left. <laughs> right. I just, it sounds like you already covered that. And then my only other thought, and I'm checking with some swimmers too, I, I agree with you, Stacy, that it's likely that a master swimmer is not going to want to come for 45 minutes. But my only thought was, is if there was a, and I don't know if this actually helps or not, as I say it out loud, but if there was a way for them to do some dry land at the pool as well, so then they have 30 minutes in the pool, but 15 minutes of dry land, whether it's, you know, in the parking lot or, you know, some other way that we could manage it so that they get a fuller workout. It, it may not work logistically, but trying to combine a dry land workout with their swim might, might help with that shrinking of time, but I, I do tend to agree with you. I think even going under an hour for these master swimmers is gonna be a, 
a cramp in their style as much as um, I agree with you, Cindy. We're also trying to maximize the, the volume of, of play, but just looking at if there's other ways to do something else to, to augment. I think it's certainly possible, Matt, it's, and it's a good idea, as long as everybody is exiting and entering at the same time. And if we only have 10 people at any given time during a lab swim, then we can cer certainly accommodate them within the, you know, diameters required for social distancing. We could also potentially split the walking lanes in half, increase um, any kind of lap lane. I, I know it's not as deep, but it's still water. Um, for some of the the um, amateur swimmers, I guess. Michelle, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just was hoping you could clarify where the ins and outs are again. Like you said, you have to in the pool. I would assume in the shallow end area, they're not like going around the pool. You mean in the pool or out of the pool? Out of the pool. Just like out of the pool. Yeah. Kind of one, one way in and one way out. You'd walk down one set of stairs and go out. If you have to go to the bathroom, you'd actually have to walk all the way around the pool to come back around to go up the stairs and to go to the bathroom because you can't go both ways. We had to, um, in order to make things um, feasible for Tara and Diana, things had to be one way. It was like you had to make sure that things were one way. Um, so this going around like towards the lake lakeside, yeah, yep. And that's, I would just see that problematic with a family of four if someone needs to go to the bathroom and hauling everyone around the pool. Yeah. And that's, that's more of a hazard than anything else. I would say cut the front of the pool. You either go straight through into the water or you use that as the exit. But mm -hmm. I just see that as a problem. You have to take your whole family if there's a bathroom issue. But. Go oh, and then there's in. also likely issues that the guards will have to pay more attention to make sure toddlers don't fall into that those sides of the pool. But so we also have, um, if our plan is to have our guards and other guards um, on deck as being social distance monitors, so we don't have our guards paying any attention to what's happening on the deck, but just focusing on the pool. Um, our guards on the deck will be focusing on um, the social distance, making sure that kids are not around the, you know, around the pool decking area, um, really focusing on that aspect so our guards can really pay attention to what's happening and not have to worry about all that stuff. And this will give the guards the opportunity to work too. So, you know, they're not, they're not bored just being social distance monitors, but they can also hop on a chair. And that just makes it, I just feel like it, it'll make it better for us because we have more eyes watching. And you clearly the, the slide is not going to be open, but the slide area, the base, yes. do you yeah. remind me how deep that is? It's four, four feet, I think. Feet. Yeah. So that's continuous as you yep. step out, mm -hmm. that's level with all of the other. Okay, so that would be a usable place for one family to be. I think that is the maximum depth of the family pool, four feet. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Michelle, or comments? The lanes not being used as lap lanes, from what I can tell, that would just be used that be part of the family space. We're not. There's not yeah. going to be lap. Lane. No. Trying to maximize every space within the pool. Okay. And those calculations are based on. You would be averaging a thousand people per week, but if we, I mean, ideally we'd want it open longer than four weeks, right? Are we, you said that was the conservative um, estimate, but ideally we would be wanting to open it a lot sooner than the 27th of July. That feels very late. Mm -hmm. 
It does. So the 27th of July is based on the fact, um, and it is very conservative, that Weston Sampson has not yet started opening the pool. Um, and so we need a six week lead time on that. Potentially, again, six weeks is also a conservative number, not for them to open the pool it doesn't take them six weeks, but for the, you know, Angela, I believe you said it was about three weeks for them to open the pool and get it clear. Well, it would be three weeks with them opening the pool and us doing everything that needs to be done. Yep. Yeah. And so within, in addition to that, we need to be hiring, training, staffing, going through the new protocols, paperwork, all of that. So that's where that, now, that date was a conservative date, certainly, but that's where we, that's where we fell. Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, Bruce. I'm sorry. Please comment, Bruce. <clears throat> so I'm just, yeah, I'm just kind of curious. So July 27th would be the open date, but what would be the close date? Good question right now. So kinda. in a non-COVID world, typically we start losing mass numbers of staff in the middle of August as they go back to college or start up their fall season high school sports. Well, it's making me think that the amount of effort, money, and organization to open it up for three, three or four weeks, is it, is it something that is, is a good idea or is it not a good idea? I mean, we, uh, yeah, I mean, think about the thousands of dollars are gonna be spent and all the efforts that people are gonna put in for maybe three weeks a pool in the summer or will the residents be so upset that the pool never opened this year or they're going to be upset anyway because it doesn't open till the end of July. You know, those are all valid points. I mean, and Bruce, we've been you know talking about this endlessly since the whole COVID thing came out. Um, that yes, there are certain decisions that have to be made that probably aren't popular or financially sound. And it's one of the things that's why as our job as commission to do this, this is why we're talking about this now that, yeah, if you were to look at this on black and white paper, it probably wouldn't make sense to do it. But if it comes down to the community and what we can do for the people of the community, this is something that we have to look at. Um, it, yeah, it's not going to be an easy decision. It's not going to be, you know, an easy task to do this, but when we do it, we do this as a team. Um, the I'm sorry, any other questions, Angela? Bruce, I just want to let you know that um, even though with the pool, um, you know, with the money and stuff, um, we have to open the pool anyways to maintain it. And it has to run for four weeks anyways for us to maintain it. So I didn't know if you knew that piece of it, um, but I just wanted to let you know that that would be something that we would still have to do anyways. Um, Is this just like because, because of like the pumps, the motors and... Circulation, yep. all the all the yep. uh, mechanical equipment has to run. It does. It's going to be in bad shape for the following year. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. It's like a car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't let it sit for too long. Okay. Um, any other questions? Because I I got a list here. <laughs> Cindy. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd like to go first, I, I have already had my questions. So okay, I mean, I, I, there might be some of the follow-ups, but hopefully we'll see what's going on. Um, I'll probably do the easy ones first here. Um, I assume we're not having a diving board. Okay. No. The water features, will they be up being like the mushroom, the, the pipes that spew out the water that's there as part of the features? Because I know that was part of the pool opening bid that we have. I assume the water features will be part of the pool. They will be in, but I don't know if they'll be turned on because we'll need to access that space um, around there for kids to swim. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll go back. We'll, um, uh, which one of these ones I want to do? Uh, we'll do in regards to we do this. Do we have the software system or capability to do a reservation system like this? is school dude is that something we can use what is the program that we're using now that if we do go through with this which i would like to see do we have the capability to do something like this Kristen, 
I, you're jump, topping up a bit. What do you got? Well, and that's it. Yes, it's a matter of how we're going to do it. Um, so the decisions about we can limit members, we can limit, we're definitely re limiting to residents. Um, it, talking about time slots and talking about boxes instead of classes, it would just be like a class registration. Um, so when we were talking about school day, we were talking about the fields, not the not the pool. So that would be that would be something that I, I, we have to look at it. It would be a little bit of detail um, once we've made some decisions. But if we can make if I can if we could make the system work for last year, we can make the system work for this year. Okay. All right. So we do have a way of managing and doing what is somewhat proposed on this document. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is <laughs> six weeks. We went from a three week to opening the pool to now a six weeks. How did we get to that number? Six weeks was always the lead time. It was four weeks for programs and six weeks for pools because of the extra training for the aquatics. So what is our typical, like if this was a non COVID, what is our typical time frame to train a lifeguard? or staff member at Rosemary Complex? Ballpark, three I, weeks, two I, weeks? I, I, right, that's Angela. what I'm, I'm more deferring towards, Angela. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it depends on how much training. Um, Give me an six, average. A week to two weeks. So we're now gonna do this three times because of the extra training? I, I mean, I just- Stagger training, because you can only have 10 people per training okay when it's in when it's in person so one of the things with most of the rescues that lifeguards perform they typically perform them on each other okay but now we can't have them do that so we can do no more than 10 people at a training we have to do five at a time and then they would have to bring their own person that they're already in a pod with to rescue. So instead of doing 20 or 30 kids at a time at a training, we have to do five. Mm -hmm. So with the groups of 10 that we're doing, so this is like all day training, there's no way that we could do like a group of 10 from eight to noon and then a second group of 10, group B, one to four. Like, it, it, like this is how we're doing it. How many groups are we talking about here? If it's we, it's depend on what, um, what level you guys want to open at and how many guards that we need. Oh, six, I mean, I mean six. So for, yeah, we can do staggered, we can do three hours at a time, but that's not enough time to train people to save lives. Like, I, agree, we, I hear you. We have yeah. to do more than three hours. Definitely. We can do three hours. I wouldn't ever make them train for more than three hours at a time anyway, but it's going to be a couple of days of three hours. So are, are these kids that are already certified, these kids are already lifeguard certified when they come to us? We're only taking the kids that we had from last year. Um, we still have to give them six weeks? No, those guys will be on board with what the facility looks like. Right. And know the okay. logistics of it. It doesn't, we don't have to train the lifeguards for six weeks, but they can't get in the water until Weston and Sampson is done. Okay, so. So it's Weston and Sampson takes somewhere between two and three weeks to between, balance the water. Call, call it three, I call it three weeks, okay. Call it three. Then we can start our training in the water. Prior to that, we can do hiring, we can do interviewing, we can do virtual stuff but we can't do any hands-on stuff until the water is balanced. That's what makes it longer than the, the program side of things because we're not waiting for somebody to balance the water. It's not so much the water though, it's, it's, the, it's the outside stuff that needs to be done. Like the cleaning of everything that wasn't taken care of last year. Like that's the main part of why it's gonna take so long because we need all hands on deck to make it happen. And now Weston and Samson's not cleaning the rails now, we're cleaning them. Um, they're not putting the, the ladders in. They're doing all, we're doing all that stuff manually now. And that's 
us, meaning me, Devin, Stace, whoever else. Are we not allowed to be on the complex when Weston and Sampson is opening the pool? No, we should be able to be there, but we have to make sure that we're socially distanced. We have to be socially distanced and there cannot be more than 10 people still. Yeah. So however many people they bring in will affect how many people we can be in there doing things at the same time. Do we know what the typical crew is that opens up a pool? They are going to bring less people because they can only have so many people. I, I don't know what they typically bring for this pool. They usually have five to eight people. I would, I'm trying to think. Okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to, and I'm, I am going back to you guys and relying on it because again, I don't know how to open a pool and I know you guys did such a great job last year. It's just, I, I, the time frame. it's just, I'm struggling with the time frame. And, and do, we, do we have a commitment from Weston and Samson yet? Because this feels like it's been dragging for to get them in here, get started. Um, do we have any idea? The answer is yes. Um, the contract is back with the town. It has to get signed by town management and has to get signed by the town council, um, it, which and they cannot start until it is completely executed. So they have com they have completed their side. It is with us. Um, I believe that everything is going to be signed by Thursday, but that's a rough, rough date. And if that's the case and we can get it executed and put back out to them, um, then they could potentially start next week. So, so can we help that, Kristen? Because um, I've had some frustration expressed to me about the timing of everything and um, the length of time till we open the pool. And I'm hearing this from select board members who feel free to talk directly to me, um, probably all of you, but, um, and keep saying, what can we do to help? And I'm happy to call tomorrow and say, this is what you can do. You can hand walk these contracts to whomever. I, I don't mind saying that. And, you know, we, we certainly can say that. Um, so what can we do to help that? Uh, same with staffing restrictions and getting yep. us hiring. I mean, I, yeah. they, that was, they that just was reiterated to us that they are fully on board. And I understand that all staffs, not just this one, but all town staffs are pressured. But this is an opportunity for all of us to do something for the community. I know this team is very invested in it. Other groups in town may not be as invested. So we just want to Tell us where to light the candle and we'll go or to light the fire and we'll go through it. I mean, yeah. Yep. Well, we, we appreciate that. It, um, the, the hold up is it is, it, it was received by David Davidson, I believe either late, late tonight, cause tonight is the town's late night during summer um, or it will be delivered first thing in the morning. It was received by DPW today. So they reviewed it um, and they went through it and made sure it was okay. And then now it has to be reviewed by Dave Davidson before it can be, signed off by either him or Kate. And then they, I believe the town council is in office on Thursday and that is when town council can sign it. So that is my understanding the absolute earliest. It can be signed and then it has to be digitally distributed with a purchase order. And so that is the final piece. And then I'm hoping we can still wrap that on Thursday and not necessarily Friday morning. And so, so Thursday is it looks to be about the, the, the fastest, and that is less than a week after receiving the um, digital signed, which is significantly quicker than contracting usually goes. This process usually takes two to three weeks. Is Weston and Samson aware of this time frame that we're bringing it down to the wire, that if we have something executed by Thursday, that we can be on their calendar by Monday, or is this a guess, or is this a kind of were penciled in a little bit and we're there just waiting to get our thumbs up. Angela, Angela hi, how are you? Good. We can't get on the books until we get our contract done by the chemical companies. If we don't have the chemicals there, we can't get them there. Okay. So the chemicals so our, can't go there until we have a signed pool contract? Yes. No, until we have the signed chemical contract. We've that's different than Weston and Samson? Yes. So where do we stand with the pool with the pool chemicals? So I believe Stacy Jackie signed filling in today. 
not for Caragua stands yesterday, two days ago, last week, I don't know, recently. Um, and it, I believe, is moving to the next step of the process. This one is done completely digital. So Western Samson was not done digitally through DocuSign. That was done um, old hard copy, but we were pushing it as fast as we can, hard copy. Um, the, I believe that with DocuSign that the town council does, it can sign it digitally, which means that he does not have to come to town office to sign these, which opens up obviously the timeline of which he can, the town council can do it, but because I believe at the moment he's only, he, it, town council usually only comes in once a week. I could be wrong. I could be very wrong at this time. And I know that now in COVID land, it was usually once, maybe twice a week dependent. Um, but I, I am, we are following up with Dave Davidson. I talked to him about, um, or talked to Cecilia about the pool opening. And then I, um, we each individually reached out to both Fillion, who does the chlorine, and uh, Puragua, who is awarded the other chemicals such as perlite and granular chlorine and uh, acid magic and all the other ones that we need and are required. I think we have a little bit of chlorine, but we need the other chemicals before. And Angela, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We are, we're trying to push those through as fast as possible as well. Um, where they are digital, we have a better chance of maybe getting them done as, at the same time as startup, but it is not something we're taking the gas off of until we get everything I have a question. Please, Bruce, <clears throat> go ahead. In, in a typical year, when does what date does the pool open? Memorial Day? We shoot for Memorial Day, yep. Yep. We and, try to do uh, it, yeah. So how many weeks behind are we? Well, to open the pool, we open May 1st to clean it and all that stuff. This year, we were planning on opening it April 27th to get the cleaning and all that stuff done. Um, so we're like five weeks behind, uh, five to six weeks, yeah, yeah, Bruce. We were kind of in a holding pattern, we were in a bit of a holding pattern because we did not know what the governor's guidelines oh, were yeah, going to be, course. right? I mean, no. So that's yeah, so it's the and well, we were all in a hiring freeze, so we couldn't even extend nobody offers. Charlie, Baker, offers. Charlie Baker could have pushed this back two more weeks, so yep. nobody. <laughs> All right, speaking of that, uh, Commissioner Tulin brought up a, one of the questions I have. Where are we or are we still under a hiring freeze? No is a good answer. So do we have a list of, so, and correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, we have most of our lifeguards, all of our lifeguards, or a quarter of our lifeguards signed up. Where do we stand? We have a good majority of our lifeguards. We have about 75% of our lifeguards. Okay. We're not going to, um, we're not going to need the staffing that we had last year. Um, so it definitely cuts, cuts down quite a bit. Okay. Um, we definitely have a strong solid supervisory staff that we would like on board. Okay. Um, and with Kate Curtin, um, our swim coach, not Kurt, coach. Yep. Um, we're hoping to utilize her at the pool as well as having another adult super, like, supervisory position down there. I think that is a good call or good idea. Um, all right. We're to, we could talk about this all night. Uh, so I guess I know this is a discussion item. I think the biggest thing that we need to do as a commission right now is pick the direction that we're going in. Is that by the numbers or at least the information that we had presented to us, I, I want to see what are we looking to do here? I mean, I'll go around, I'll give my opinion at the end, but you know, I want to hear from all the commissioners. What do, what do you want to do? So we'll go to Commissioner Chaston first. And, and sorry, okay, what do I want to do in terms of like if you like so if we had to do just lap swim or just family or option C if you want to put it that way what was our option three that was on there like pull it up what direction are we go or would you go in would you do pool option three pool option two or pool or pool option one uh, 
I, I, pool option one, I hate to say it, but I would do pool option one because we could serve the most people. Uh, that being said, I feel badly for the families. And, and so I guess I have to change my option already and go to the one that is family swim just because I can't do that to people with small children and families. Um, the lap swim, we can serve the most people, but I think we built this pool for both lap swimmers and families. And I think we lean toward the families. If you look at the size of the pools and the slides and the water features, right? We definitely lean that way. So I'm going to go with um, that we try to do both. Um, and I'm gonna say we try our hardest to shorten up that six week time frame because I, I just don't know how we explain that to um, the outside world. Um, we, we really could barely explain it to Bruce and he sat here and listened to all of our conversation. So that tells you what it'll be like with the outside world. Um, but I guess I would go with the option that serves both groups. Um, option three. It. Okay. Commissioner Tulin. I agree, Cindy. We have to go with option three. It, it reaches more of the community. I also think that even though option one technically on paper hits more people, I don't think you're going to fill every slot with swimmers throughout the day. I mean, maybe in our current environment, people working from home more, you might, but um, I think we have to have something for families. I think we're also going to be at a little bit of whimsy around how many families are actually going to come. Um, I think it's a complete mixed bag of how people participate, but I think we have to have the options. Um, one question to, we don't have to answer it now, but um, it was just posed to me is, you know, in all of our time slots, are we still requiring showers or wetting down before a swimmer goes in the pool like you're always supposed to? Um, and if we don't have locker rooms, are we just gonna have a hose laying around? So, uh, how, right, so yeah, exactly. So it's just something to consider in that in and out time, but- uh, We have two outdoor- I was gonna say, yeah, I thought we did. Showers that we can utilize, but we're only gonna utilize two of them because one of them would be in the way of the six feet social distancing line to go to the bathroom. All right, uh, Michelle, your thoughts. I, I think absolutely option three. I think offering the pool without an option for children to get in it would be, it would be terrible. <laughs> Um, and I understand, I, I do agree that there are going to be frustrations coming from families like, are they really only going to get one slot in the summer? That feels challenging. I think if there's ways of you know, tightening up the, either the timing or we have lap swims every other day as opposed to every day. So we're able to open up the earlier for families, like don't do the 7 to 1230 for lap pools every every day. I think the priority should be getting families full time, even if it's limited. Um, it's really important. All right. Bruce, I, I know you're new to this and kind of getting all bombarded at once, but I'd love to just get your, you know, opinion of us kind of walking into this. What do you think? I, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Michelle's thought that I think Getting back in the lap swim, because there's so many children that have been stuck at home, stuck in their backyards. People are buying pools left and right, so some people can't afford to do that. I think opening up the time for the family swim would probably serve the town better. And, you know, the lap swim is very important as well, but I still go like almost like one third, two thirds with the families. Weighted, weighted heavily on the family instead of the. Uh, and the adults can do other exercise. I think it's probably mostly adults doing the lap swim. So that's that's my two cents. Okay. No, I mean, and I, I think everybody, you know, brought up great points. And I, I'm also in agreement, too, that, I mean, I think option three, you know, we need to execute this option. Um, it, it just, it, it, it's the best for the community is what I feel. Um, you're going to get the widest net that you can have people to come in and, and use this. So I, I option three is what I would really like us to, you know, try for uh, and, you know, make this, make this possible. 
Um, I know that this is just more of a discussion item and it's not an action item, but Stacy, I want to get your idea on this. Um, I think that option three is certainly best for the community. Definitely. And mm -hmm. we have laid out some protocols and we can certainly on paper execute what we would like. Uh, the, the three things that I want us to think about as a group are the number of guards need to go up the more family swim there are because of the, when you have eight lap swimmers, you need one guard and one supervisor. When you have families with young children, you need a lot more lifeguards. Um, and we're going to have to pod our lifeguards into teams so that they only work together. Like there'll be a team A, a team B, a team C, however many we need. Um, so that if one of those guards gets sick, we don't take out the whole staff. We take out that pod. Okay. Does that make sense so far? How many pods, I mean, ballpark, what were you thinking here? Three, four, six groups? I mean. So for your lap swim as is right now, for, sorry, for your family swim as is. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes and thinking at the same time. It looks like 11, Angela, staff versus the seven staff for um, a lap swim. Ten, isn't it? I'm sorry, say that again. I think it's two teams of 10. Angela, you're muted. <laughs> Space bar. <laughs> um, for lap swim, only in the mornings, we only need six people um, to run the facility. But we would have groups of two um, only because that's we'll, we would just alternate and that would, you know, if one group goes out, at least we still have another group in place and it's only for the morning. So it's not a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. What about for the family swim? How many people for do we need during that? Swim, we're open from Monday through Friday. We're going to need three teams for um, the afternoon, which would be, I think it's 30. Um, so we could alternate. I think that's what it was. I have to go back and look at it. 21 aquatic staff. Was it 21? Yeah, three, the three non, not aquatic, right? For no matter what shift. And then yes. that's nine, 30 total, 21 aquatic. Thank you. And what was the reason to not be open all days? Just from a cost perspective, from a staffing perspective? Well, it was more of a, go ahead, Angel. No, go ahead. It was more of a staffing perspective. Um, we're going to have these teams of kids that are going to have to work close to five days a week, whereas typically they would be on more of a rolling schedule. Um, and it doesn't have to be Monday to Friday. We were actually like we were rolling around Tuesday to Saturday and even Wednesday for Sunday just to get the maximum weekend days in there. Um, but it was for the number of staffing hours that we need to do. And because we can't steal one kid from a team to make to sub in for another kid, we have to have um, a separate substitute list for that because we can't cross contaminate the teams. Okay. Stacy, is that a mandate from the state or is that a best practice? Because I just see that that's a management nightmare for y'all and knowing how much fun you guys had with scheduling of staff last year. It's, it's not that hard this year. Honest to God, after last year, and this is cake. Ends up. You're um, on recorded message. Yeah, exactly. Angela. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't do that. Because there's only one shift. There's only one shift and that's it. Okay. All right, There's that makes only sense. One shift, and we're not shifting the guards around. No, each team um, does a shift. Everybody, yeah. like, team A does this shift five days a week. Team yeah. B does this shift X amount of days a week. Yeah. And that's it. So while it is, it will be difficult when we have kids calling in because 
um, they're too tired in the morning or um, they all of a sudden flake on us and want to go away, then we, that, that's when the difficulties are going to come in, not yeah. the scheduling part. How many hours per week will be, uh, again, I know it's a loaded question. How many hours per week do you think we would be able to give the staff? Like if they're used to doing a 40 hour week, are we giving them 20? Are we? Least. Yeah. If we were to open both pools, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's my, the one thing I want you to think about. Oh yes. Number two is there are far, and there is research, no, I do not have it, but I can find it for you if you want it far less rescues happening during lap swim than there will ever be during a family swim. And while that is typical, no matter when we open, what is not mm -hmm. typical is now my staff will be required to wear masks in a chair and we have to teach them and hope that they remember to take their mask off before they jump in and make a rescue because those masks will immediately suction to their face. Can um, I ask a question and I believe you, I'm no doctor. Is it specifically outlined as a mask or could it be a face covering? It, everything is face covering, that is correct. Okay, so it could be a, what are they calling them? The gaiters or the, uh, 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 can't think of the other word, what they're buffs. Bandana. Bandana, no, not, it's a buff. Like they, so they could wear something like that. Like I know with a mask, like the N95 mask, if they, those things get wet, they're ruined. Cotton so if, you, if they did have a bandana type or gaiter or buff, that would be suitable if it did get wet, it wouldn't ruin. I'm not worried about ruining. I'm worried about them not being able to believe, breathe no. when they jump in the water to rescue. I understand that, but it's easier to take out something like this than to take a whole mask off. But I, it was just more of a technical question on yeah. my end. It's, it's all face coverings. We okay. cannot require official masks. Okay. And we won't be able to get actually N95 masks. They'll just be face coverings. Okay. Um, and then the last thing, and this will be true for the pool as well as the programs. Again, protocols we can do, guidelines we can do. We can put everything on paper. What we don't know is going to happen is what happens in practice. So if in three days or four days or two weeks, we find that this becomes unmanageable, the, the staff and the department is going to need your backing and, you, and a statement saying that we reserve the right to roll it back. I think whatever we do, we do it as a team. Because, when, because we're going to have to, before we even start registering, say that somebody registers for August 1st, but we have been already, like we've started this. It isn't working. We can't manage it things are becoming unsafe for the staff and for the members and we need to roll it back. People need to know that ahead of time. Our signups are only going to be every week. That is so that is yeah. Commissioner Tulin, peace. Hey, groovy. Um, I'm in agreement. I can support that as long as we have a proper communication plan. I have to say I'm very upset to hear that everything was canceled for the rest of the summer. I understand why, but I was not communicated. So if we can't have you all making that decision unilaterally without us being informed or consulted. So I agree with our chair, it is, we are one team, but we need to have a proper communication and a proper set of real guidelines of how we're gonna measure that. Fair enough. Great. Okay. Uh, was that the three things or was there something else out there? That was it. Okay. All right. So I think the direction we're going in is that I think we all agree that option three is the suitable option of what we want to go into. Um, and we should start pursuing that. Anything else in the real to do with the pool? Because I know we just are on letter, uh, letter A here for discussion items. I know we can always go back and have conversations about this, but are there any other questions, concerns, or ideas that we want to talk about the pool? Because I'll be honest, the summer programs is just as juicy as the pool. So I, I'll still talk about it, but if people want to move on to summer programs, I have no problem moving on to summer programs, or if you want to stay in the pool, I'll stay in the pool. Do you want to make an regarding option three? I'm sorry, say that again. It's only a discussion item. Yeah, it's only a discussion, not a voting. 
or action. All right. Uh, here, nothing about the pool. Let's move on to summer programs, the second part of our <laughs> letter B. All right, Stacy, take us through this one. It's, a little, it's only a one pager. So is the pool. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was two pages. My bad. Mm -mm. Um, I'm echoing. Is everybody on mute besides me? Thank you. Um, okay, so basically what we come up with is um, there's two options, one session and two, a morning session only or a morning and an afternoon session, three hours of pop, minimum, there'll be a minimum, a maximum number of 10 kids per group with two counselors and or staff. Um, the, let me be clear that the facilities listed are not confirmed, they are just idealistic of where we can potentially they were they were chosen because of the 30 square foot indoor space rule and for those of you that don't know for every kid that we we have they need to have 30 square feet and an indoor space 30 square feet radius in the event of weather so we we are required by the guidelines to have an indoor space where our groups can be 30 square feet away from each other each kid and they can't move Yep. Um, so that's where we we were spitballing some of these locations we are reaching out to facilities and find out which potential locations we have I am going to be requesting maps to look at the interior of these schools to find out where else besides your typical gymnasium and cafeterias we could potentially put groups um, Sunita Williams is already off that list special ed has taken that over so we will not be able to access that one um, so, to, just to be clear, we are working with facilities to find out which locations we can use. But that does mean that cricket is off the table, defazio is off the table, memorial is off the table. Okay. Stacy, the um, cabana at defazio wouldn't work. It is not an enclosed building and it needs to be enclosed if there is severe weather. So it can't just be a tent. That was our original plan and our original protocols, but when the guidelines came out, we had to switch them up. And we'd only be able to fit one group of 10 in the whole school, or that's one pocket that we could then... So one. the way the protocols work is a group has to operate together as a pod. They cannot cross over. The staff cannot change. It just has to be. So we have to find spaces where these groups can be all 12 of them in a space socially distant. So they can't be in a classroom, most classrooms, I should say, in an elementary school, because there's not enough square footage of each classroom. Um, so typically it's going to be the cafeteria or the gymnasium. Some places have a performance center, um, but certain performance centers have like slews of chairs like in the audience, they have audience chairs. And so if we put kids in there, then we have to clean those chairs. Um, and then that adds to just the whole process. So we were looking at open spaces where these groups of 12 can fit safely because you can't split them apart. You can't put one counselor with six kids in, in a classroom and split them apart because you need to have two adults present at all time for the safety of the children. So <laughs> they can be outside and six feet apart, but if you move them inside, they have to be a 30 foot circumference. Yes, because of the air quality, because when you're inside, either you're using recycled air or, you know, if it's a storm, the windows, all the doors and windows are shut. So you're all breathing in the same air. So they have to be further apart than they even would if they had a face, even if they had a face covering. Correct. They will they will be required to wear face coverings. Yes, that's that doesn't make sense. I'm and I'm not blaming you. That that just that doesn't make sense. Eight me. pages of guidance. There's a yeah. There's there's a few things in there that you're like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I mean. Uh, it, so that is that is the the driver of this. You know, originally when we were revamping, we were at three locations. Now we are looking at five different locations more staff, more equipment, 
more first aid supplies, more PPE, all of those things. Again, totally doable and great for the community, but we still have to factor in a lot of these moving parts and more so with the programs than with the pool. Um, everything looks great on paper and then in practice when you put six-year-olds or eight-year-olds um, they can't touch each other and they can't cross group they can't like touch another group or cross like bump into the other group so um, hence the typically only one group per site Matt is uh I, I forget where gyms are in the opening, but would the YMCA be a potential partner with us? Let us use Greenfield, let us use their facility or the BSC or even Babson. I don't know if Babson's running their programs or not, um, but if there are other locations that are not being fully utilized, we also have the PTC building, which is empty um, and that's right at Cutler Park. So maybe there are some options to leverage other spaces. You know, so you could do what we do up at Ridge Hill. You could do that at PTC potentially, um, right? Use Cutler Park instead of Ridge Hill. And then you have the PTC. Just looking at other options and other places where we might have options for buildings. Well, Cutler Park is not under our jurisdiction. That's in the state jurisdiction. Um, so I oh, know. I understand that. We'd have to go through that as well, but I'm just saying. It, I think that building was bought too from. Oh, it's a company in Framingham is taking it over. Yeah, yeah IDG is take is going to be taking over the lease. I don't know what the time frame is, but they, you know, I I'm expecting. You know, they they have a huge cafeteria on the first floor. It's readily accessible from the back. Um, they have other. Uh, spaces that you could use. They also have the parking garage, which may not be fully enclosed, but it is a safe structure. Um, so that could be another alternative. Just again, thinking through a site and, a, and an option. Question I have is, so say nine o'clock in the morning, we're going on our program, it's, it's doing really well. 11 o'clock, the rain clouds come in. How do we get the kids in the program to those buildings like if you're at greensfield you're doing a program and say the high school is where their shelter in place kind of thing is we just scurry them down there i mean like how, how do we get the kids to the places um we're gonna have to operate each individual program within a close enough proximity to the building so that we'll be using the school buildings and the school fields they'll have to be close enough and then we basically are going to have to get them to all be in line six feet apart and walk them safely there as quickly as we can run first so, so it'll be a lot like herding cats in a rainstorm mm -hmm. um, just at a distance basically um they'll get washed off though the, yeah everybody grab a pool noodle don't touch anybody else's pool noodle <laughs> so like so these schools that you have listed i know that's just kind of a hypothetical list are these normal locations that we run programs at during the summer or are we doing are we picking these locations because of the schools some of those locations are we switch every year so those are locations that we've used in the past um, I had asked the staff to tell me which lo which of the schools makes sense as far as indoor space, and that's where we started brainstorming. So, like, as this is just really a brain. So, my understanding is that we would definitely have something at cricket and some of the other fields where we can have it. We can pack kids in, but because we can no longer pack kids in, we have to be uh, more selective with our locations. Somebody else using Pollard. It's shut down for the season, is that correct? Yeah, yeah the, the floors are being done. done. The other the floors are being done. And is our facility too small? Um, so that was brought up actually by town management. Um, the facility is not necessarily too small. Uh, it's more about the outdoor space and the fact that the pool would be operating at the same time and also that it's also the public health building 
So we would have additional people coming in. Um, so we, we haven't counted it out. There's just a lot more logistics because the back entrance of the multi-purpose room is also near where the people at the pool would be. I don't know. So just looking at the numbers that, and again, I take it these numbers are resident wise or are these right pulled from what we pulled last year? Like we had on average 350 kids per week in 2019. These are direct numbers. Yes. yes. Matt. Uh, I I'm just going to cut to the chase. I think we still have to do this as well, Chris, Stacy. Um, I know it's a lot, but I actually think I think there's options to make this doable. Even if we run fewer programs uh, than we did last year, um, again, the community needs this. We need this, um, and I think this will be a benefit to, particularly having options, knowing that we're going to be limited in the pool and we're going to be limited in what we can do. I, I think we need to be looking at both. Well, that's a good call. Uh, Cindy. I agree that I think we have to do this. Um, I like the option that serves the most people, obviously, um, but I would leave it to the staff to, um, to tell me what you think are the most popular times. Um, do we need this, uh, when I look at option one versus option two, um, you know, are we better off to do the, the two half day things? Um, it seems to me that it's worth it. You serve um, twice as many people. More than right? twice. More than twice, um, with not that many more staff. So, I, Angela, is I say something on that? If we do the morning and afternoon, we have to have double the staff. Double the staff. Because our morning staff can't be with the same group in the afternoon. And I don't know if we have the capability of doing that. Okay. Do we have the capability if we We could... may have to take that. Uh, we may have to have a deeper conversation internally about that because I don't know either. Um, and I don't want to waste all of our time for us spitballing back and forth about what we think we can do. But I think we have to either figure out if the guidelines say be, that we can do two, two, two groups. The guidelines aren't conclusive and communities around us are reading it very different ways. Um, so I feel like we have to come up with a plan yeah, I mean, uh, what feels best for our community? I agree with you, Stacey. I think two things on it, right? One, we're talking 40 people a week, which sounds like a lot, but, and it probably is, but it is 40 people if you do it twice. The other side is, is uh, restaurants are serving hundreds of people in takeout situations. So I understand the difference in complexities, but I agree with you, there's got to be some leeway in how that's managed just based on what's happening with food service and other areas. Uh, this is different, but if you look at touch points of different employees, something to think through, but I, I agree. We shouldn't debate it here. Just would love to see the options. And if we do move ahead with this, is this, are we either doing offering virtual sessions or physical sessions, or can we do both? We'll answer at once. Staff both. We were to do both. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. We will. We wouldn't be able to virtually do both um, if we were to double up. If we were to do the morning and the afternoon, because we would just be whittling away down on all of our staff. Michelle, right. I can't hear you. Oh. 
Chris, can you go on mute? Um, so we probably touch more families by doing it virtually than, you know, I, I, my concern is doing, if we were only to be able to do one session and getting 70 kids per week, that's not, we're not reaching very many families. And we, so it sounds like, but if we were to go with that approach, we could probably supplement that with some sort of virtual curriculum. Okay. But if we were able to commit to the double sessions, then we would only be able to do that one. Okay. It's helpful. You're muted. Chris, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I didn't hit the space bar again. Sorry. Uh, Cindy, you want to get your input and then we'll go to Bruce. I apologize. I, I'm good. I have no input. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, any comments? Well, this is kind of like all new to me, so I mean, <clears throat> it seems like the more more kids that can be that can be uh, experienced, this would be great. But if you're gonna have to double the staff. That's so the staff can't go from morning to afternoon. They have to be separate. From is that what I'm understanding? So if you have a morning session, that same staff can't do the afternoon. Is that we need double that, the people? That's what we need to look into a little bit closer, definitely. Yeah, it just seems like uh, when Matt was saying about the restaurants and they're serving multiple people. Uh, it just it seems like it's a little bit, a uh, little bit over the top if the the people that work in the morning from nine to twelve can't do the afternoon sessions as well. Some sort of uh, information available. What? makes sense as far as that goes yeah i think we need to look into that a little bit further and find out how other communities are reading it um to make sure that we're we we have a, a good baseline on that we also need to look into other kids communities too um that have like elliot has their performance center room that has a one-way that has a door that goes out to the playground and out to the gym and that comes back in that could serve as 10 kids. They also have the cafeteria that goes out to the backyard and comes back in that could also serve as 10 kids. And then they also have the gym that goes out and also comes back in and that could serve another 10 kids. And now all these kids are going in and out in different doors. So we don't have to worry about that. If we can find a facility that has a door that goes outside and and you can go in and out from a specific room, we would be able to put more kids in one building. If that, does that make any sense? Yep, definitely. Is this something that we need to reach out to the school committee to get their permission or is this more of a town ask or like- Facilities. We, okay, and facilities, I, I think you said is more than glad to help us out. Yep, and we need to work with them and, and sure up exactly which facilities we could have access to. And then the process from there will be to take a look at the maps and the square footage of some of the interior spaces that are big enough to find out how many groups we can have at each of them. In and completely virtual for this woman. All right, so it looks like we're all in agreement that we want to do something for the summer programs. It's just we're looking for a little clarification to see if we can do two sessions in a day, an a.m. and a p.m. So I, I think we're all in agreement. We want to do something, but we need we need to find out what we can do. So at least. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. Tulin. So how quickly can we get going? I mean, I know that there's logistical things and everything, but, you know, when are we? looking to get programs rolling the dates we have suggested are four weeks july 20th the last two in july and the first two in august
Um, and again, on the program side, similar to the pool side, everything looks fine on paper and in practice when you bring specifically kids into this, we have to come up with plans and protocols that are, do we have a zero strike policy if some child breaks the barrier to another child? You know, is it a no strike and then they go home? Um, mask situations with kids. Um, these, you know, we're going to have more behavior issues, I think, than we typically do. And we're, we're going to ask, camp is a very fun, outdoor, you know, kids can make mistakes and then they get to come back and repair. And now it is going to be a lot more like a classroom situation where there's going to be a lot more routine and a lot more you have to stay in your lane. Um, and I want to make sure that we're setting up our kids for success and that we're not potentially doing harm by saying you made a mistake and now you can't come back. Um, that emotionally can be very triggering and very difficult for a kid. And they have already had a really tough end of school year. And I want to make sure that we're setting up these kids that are still kids and they've been cooped up and they're going to want to see their friends and they're going to make mistakes. And, but we still have to worry about the safety of them, the safety of the other kids and the safety of our staff within these protocols. Um, so we, we, we definitely need to be all in on this and we need to have a statement ahead of time. Again, if it looks great on paper and then we have to roll it back, how do we handle that? I'm not expecting anything to go wrong. Hopefully everything goes perfectly fine, but I want us to be prepared for that. I think it's important for these kids' emotional and well-being to make sure that camp is still camp, even though it's totally different and they're in a whole new world. Uh, but, you know, from all the parents that I've talked to and, you know, experience, people that have taught in different communities, like kids are really struggling and a lot of kids are regressing. Um, and we have to be prepared to get these guys out and moving and know that they may not fall directly in line where we need them to be. Um, and, and so I'm looking for your advice and, and your suggestions on that and what we can do to make this a really positive experience for these guys after a really tough end of school year. I have one point I'd like to bring up. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the high school. There's like three areas up there that have like a pretty much separate in and out, but there's only one set of bathrooms for all three areas. And how is it going to be managed at these other, other facilities? Are the restrooms going to be monitored? So one person goes in, one, one person goes out. I'm not sure how that would work. Yeah, the custodians on site would be helping us with that, as well as our staff. But yeah, they would only be allowed one in, one out, just because the bathrooms don't offer enough space for more than one kid, child. Yeah, and I, I'm with you, Stacey, on figuring out contingencies. Like, these are all contingency plans, right? Unless we Definitely. were doing, you know, a stage program and, you know, a play program that might need a stage or whatever. But these are all contingencies, backup plans. So I, I, I get that. Um, I don't know. I've been watching the kids around the neighborhood, and I, I do think that we need to have some reasonable accommodation because every family's philosophy is a little different. Right. So I see kids running around with masks on playing with kids who don't have masks on. Um, you know, some, you know, it all depends on how to, as you pointed out earlier, how families are, you know, are they, you know, working in a small, small circle where there's three families that have all said, Hey, we're just going to socialize together with the three families and we're going to sort of deal with it. And are they carrying it through? So, I agree. It's got to be fun. It's got to be engaging for the kids. I think from what I'm seeing in the neighborhood, a lot of kids have just adapted. I agree that the school stuff has been a challenge, but when I watch them play outside, they're playing, right? They're, they're playing like we did when we were kids, which is kind of great to see. Um, they're not as structured. I think some of the feedback I've heard from parents is, they actually are excited that it's not as, you know, their kids are not going to be fully structured and have every hour planned out 
um, because there is no daycare, there is no sleep away camps, everything is not measured out minute by minute. Um, so I, I, while I agree with you that we have to plan for the worst, I think we might be pleasantly surprised in how a lot of these kids just are pretty resilient and hey, this is their new normal. Particularly the younger they are, they're not gonna know the, the difference really. I agree, I just wanna make sure that we're on the same page and if it does become and again, with the we certainly need to communicate all the way through. But if it does become a concern that the department has, you know, we're all on the same page, whether we decide to keep moving forward or whether we decide to shut it down, um, that we have that sort of ability to have those conversations. Because I don't, you know, without being able to put this into practice or rely on any other community to say like, well, how did it go for you? Because we're all in the same spot right now. Um, you know, I, I think we have to be willing to make the hard call, not just now, but after we start up, if necessary. All right, so we're agreeing that we're gonna do something for the summer programs. Uh, we're at least gonna do the AM sessions and we'll look to see about possibilities of doing a two-part program. Agree? Thumbs up. Okay. Woo. Letter C. Uh, these are probably ones we're probably going to crank through here. Uh, project updates. Where's... Any projects we got going on besides the dredging that is done? The dredging looks great. Great. All right. Events. What um, events that... do we got going on? That was going to be the conversation about the drive-in movie, but you know, we talked about it in the director's report that it is being just slid to the side for the moment and then we will bring it back in. It's on the back burner. Slow, it's a slow roast. Exactly. Um, all right. Walker Pond. Stacy had a little meeting with uh, one of the uh, members and our, assist our new assistant town manager. So Stacey, if you can give us a brief recap on that, that would be great. Yeah, I'd love to. So on Wednesday, I had a meeting with Dan Gilmartin and Katie King, who was our new assistant town manager. Excuse me. And um, basically, I just got the backstory from Dan. Um, you know, he had the joy of meeting with the two newest members of the town staff. Um, so uh, he brought us up to speed. Um, we asked him to send any documentation or any reports that we probably have, but it would be easier to put our finger on if he just sent it to us. Um, you know, it sounds like something clearly needs to be done. He seemed to understand that there was a lot going on in the world and it wasn't going to be on the, on the front burner. It was going to uh, need a little bit of time. We agreed to meet in about a month, um, to reconvene in about a month. He did ask about, he felt like there was support from the commission um, and he did ask about if there was a focus group or if there would be a reconvening of a fo focus group that had Walker Pond members as well as um, commission members. Um, but overall, it was a it was a great meeting, and he was super excited to be talking to us and and being heard. So from what I remember, and Kristen, you can back us up on this, and I think Angela too, is right around the end of February, beginning of March, that we did agree that we would come up with a focus group and we had a list of participants that we were going to reach out to to be part of this focus group. But that probably, when we were ready to send out that email, March 14th to 17th fell in and we never sent anything out, or did we? Okay, we never sent anything out. So I think we need to go through that list again of the people that we want to have on that on that focus group. I know that we said there would be at least the director of the park and rec, a commissioner, um, someone from the conservation committee, uh, certain members from their Walker Pond Association, uh, town engineer Tony Delgazo, I think was on that list. And I think I haven't written down, there might've been one or two more people, but then that was it. Um, what was that, Kristen? Penny. Hey. 
Yes. Eddie. Oh, yes. Ed, Ed, Ed Olson, Eddie. too, because I know that he has had that. So I think that list that I know it's it is something that we do owe them the time to start, you know, working on this. But it's you're right. It's it's not even in the kitchen right now with everything that we've got going on, that our main focus is the pool and the programming and everything about keeping people safe. Not saying that Walker Pond is not important. It's just where it falls right now and everything that we're going on. It, it's something that we can't commit to having a meeting yet because we have so many other things that take precedence over it. Cindy. Mr. Chair, um, I think we did commit that we put together a focus mm -hmm. group. And the idea was that we would work towards getting this on the capital plan and perhaps um, putting it forth as a CPC project. Mm -hmm. That's what we committed to, that that's what we would work towards. Uh, but again, we didn't foresee that we wouldn't be having yes. meetings and, and, and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nice if we don't lose sight of that so that we oh, get another season. Um, so, because I would like to get it on the capital plan and at least have it stacked up against the other plans and um, so that we can see if there's an appetite with the town to move forward. Um, I don't know how we do that at this point, but um, even if that's the minimum that we can do is to, mm -hmm. to get it no, into the planning process, I think we should try to do that. Uh, that being said, you know, staff is, there's no question staff is working hard and overworking, overworked. So um, mm -hmm. I'm mindful of that, but it'd be, it would be difficult to lose another season to those people because we did kind of them by saying we can't do it last year, but we'll look at it this year. So is it worth at least sending out a, a courtesy email to everyone on the list that we had had to say, hey, in time, we'd like to get together and discuss this. We won't really put a date on it yet because we don't know, but at least we can start getting the feedback from the people on that list to let them know that like, we like to tap you on the shoulder to kind of look into this because you have either worked with it before or are familiar with it. At least we can start getting the feedback from those people that we listed to say, Hey, listen, we're looking to get this on the capital plan. would really appreciate your input. And if something does come out of it in the next, say, 30 days of people maybe find a little time on their schedule to at least start having conversations and Zoom meetings, we can at least do something like that. So when, Stacy, you meet with Dan Gilmartin, you know, next month, we can at least say, hey, listen, we heard back from someone from the Conservation Committee, Tony Delgazzo, um, you know, but we haven't heard from Eddie yet, but at least we can get some, you know, communication out to him that we have done something and we're, we'll be following up on the other means. Yep. Right. And, and also when, um, when you, when the staff is asked to work on the capital uh, project plan, which you will be, regardless of all this stuff, we will still have to do planning. Um, keep this project in mind so that we don't forget it. Yes. Don't forget, at least put it on the list. And again, it may not stack up against some of the other projects favorably, but I think it will at some point. Lynn, isn't, okay. it, isn't the decision that it wouldn't necessarily need to be, or it could be on ours, but more importantly, it needed to be on Tony's plan, right? That was the bigger one. So I just think yeah. ensuring that he yeah. has it on radar and that we are able to at least help facilitate what's needed in order for him to make the decision as to whether or not it gets on the plan, I think would be important. Cause I agree with you, Cindy, to allow, to at least not address it and have another season go by would just be so unfortunate. Um, because I, I do think there's agreement amongst the commission, the commissioners and the commission um, and those that we've talked to that it's important to do something about it. I agree, I definitely agree. So, all right, so I think if we can start making up maybe just a quick little, I don't know, say form letter, but introduction to what we're planning on and if we can go through that list of names uh, that we mentioned and add them to it, um, I think that would be a great start and see where the feedback comes from them. Okay. okay. Do you need me to go through the names again, Kristen, or did you get everybody? You're recorded. Okay, perfect then. All right, uh, F, staffing. We're good, we went through this in the director report. Nice, town meeting, great job last night. Best town oh. meeting ever. Oh, sorry, oh, oh, oh. go back, Cindy. Staffing, so Devin, is, is, he, is he being paid? Are we okay with that? I mean, I, I don't, I hate to think someone is working for us, hasn't gotten on the payroll and all that stuff. Is, is that all square? 
I, I don't need to be in the middle of it, but I just would like to know everything is square. Maybe that, um, I've set up a meeting with Rachel and or the HR head director of HR and the director of accounting with Stacey to make sure that our paperwork is not lost and that we can maybe make it a bit quicker so that when Angela and Chris make final decisions about who's coming on staff, including Devin would be our first case study because he needs to be on staff as soon as possible, um, then we can move promptly and, and in the most efficient manner. Most efficient manner. Okay, okay, and remember we, we are willing to, um, to, to make some phone calls if it helps for us to do that because we are hearing from those other members of um, town boards of, you know, why aren't you moving more quickly? And I'm happy what to do say, you need, yeah. not us, you know, we help. So, uh, and not to impugn any of the other departments, but um, maybe we need to get a little priority at times for this stuff. So keep that in mind. Thank you. All right, anything else in regards to staffing? All right, none. Town meeting. Cindy and I were there last night representing Park and Rec. Luckily, no questions or comments came our, came our way, but I thought it was actually executed very well. I thought people did what they needed to do. Uh, it was a beautiful night to have it. Uh, and I want to commend the town and everyone that set it up. I know Kristen was there checking in people's names for Precinct J, I think it was. Um, but I just thought, you know, for something that was first time outside, I thought it was executed extremely well. I would agree. Uh, right. Dedication to Dave DeChico. That was fantastic too. Yeah. Really great shout out to Dave. That was great. Chris um, asked two people with dogs to go and remove their dogs from Memorial Park. Yeah, I chased them down. I did. Um, all right, board members. <laughs> Bruce, I know that there was some email communication earlier today that you and Teddy Eaton are chasing around to get a time that you can be sworn in, correct? Thursday, 9.30. Fantastic. Matt, Congratulations. I think Matt also has to be sworn in because he is officially, he and Bruce cannot vote tonight because he is not officially a board member until he is sworn in by Teddy. I'll reach out to Teddy tomorrow. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, letter I, this was something that I talked about, but you know what? It's, if I'd like to move that to the next uh, next board meeting, because it's just, I don't want to say I don't want to talk about it now, but it's not worth talking about it now. Chris, right, so can we just talk about, just talk about uh, tennis? Oh, Okay. So yes, all right, so we actually, we will talk about it. Um, I know that there are a lot of people on social media that they're advertising, oh, I can give tennis lessons at certain you know, tennis courts. Here's my information. That is not in our policy right now. That is something, as we mentioned, that these courts are open up for passive recreation and town use. They should not be used for for-profit organizations. So people that are asking to say, oh, I can do this at the fields, we need to nip this in the bud. We need to reach out to them to say, what you're doing is not part of our policy. And if we need to send them emails and reach out, again, we're gonna be nice about it and stress of what it is, but they are not allowed to take or do lessons of any sports at any of our fields. Because God forbid someone gets hurt on that, who do you think they're gonna come after? Can we do something more broadly without having to do individual outreach? I mean, we haven't. I mean, I feel like it's every day we're seeing these vo um, posted on the Needham page about, um, you know, people wanting to provide lessons. Like, can we just be regularly posting something on our own site about this is how the field should be used. They should be not be, be used for, for, you know, for profit um, organizations. I mean, just being a bit more proactive. Is that, is that not mentioned in the daily field status that goes out? Yes. I'm not sure that goes to people that ask for it, first of all. That and is correct. People that are wanting to do the practices are not asking for field status or permission um, to do much. So I would just post, you know, have, yes, I will be quiet. Oh, no, you don't have to be quiet. I just was, you know, getting in line. We can certainly post something on our own Facebook page 
Um, staff typically does not post on the Needham pages. Um, we respond to things, but I don't know how often we reach out. That could be wrong. I'm getting a weird look from Kristen. But I also think it, um, you know, peer pressure goes a long way for good things. And I think if you guys post, that would certainly help us. It can't hurt us. As long as you say it nicely. So, so for example, I shared, so Chris Gerstle and I received a text message tonight during the meeting, um, which was a post from a young person offering tennis lessons at Newman. So I, I copied that and I shared it during the meeting with the staff. I didn't share it with the other commissioners. I didn't know if that was proper or not, but I shared it with the staff so that um, Stacy and Angela and Kristen have seen it. But it's basically someone... Yeah, it's some young person who's probably well-intentioned. I'm a sophomore, junior at such and such a college, and I'm a tennis player, and I'll, I'm offering lessons at Newman. Please contact me. Um, so I, I, when you know. those things happen, typically one of the staff members, typically Kristen, to be fair, she does all our social media madness, reaches out and messages the person and say, hey, I'm sure you didn't know the regulations. Here they are. If you're interested in potentially running programs through the rec department, we can have that conversation. However, we do not allow this because of insurance and liability and all that. It's sort of like a blank uh, statement. Okay. But we don't, so I don't we'll do that. Okay. Kristen does do that when we see, when those things come to us, we do respond to them individually like that. Um, but we don't do it to the like, whole page. We do it by direct message. And, and do we not have a tennis monitor anymore? No tennis monitors? We are looking into bringing that back. Actually, Kristen just brought it up today and I think now is the time to, to move forward with that. Okay. okay. I, I have had a, several complaints. I, I hesitate to say several because they've all been from the same person, but more than one complaint from the same person. Who is it? We're going to put a note on their membership. Um, well, they have a tennis badge so uh, but the complaint is that there are people teaching tennis and this person and when I go with my family um, I've been able to get a court but on the court next to me someone's teaching and then there'll be someone come along waiting and a couple times I've said to the waiting party you know they're giving lessons and then I was supposed to so feel free to go over there but he, he said what happened to the tennis monitors I'm like I don't know that we have a tennis monitor right now so that position open? Um, like it, two things. Um, like everything else, they were frozen. So now we can start to bring them back. Cindy, uh, Kristen was asking which location. High school. Do you know, Chris? I, I actually. I think it was the high. I think it was the high school and Mills. High school and Mills have been the two biggest areas. Newman only has one net, so that makes sense. <laughs> Which are going up at the end by the end of the week. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe uh, we should say no. It's on my list. Following the rules, we're not putting the nets up. <laughs> what has been the reaction when we do reach out to those people, Kristen, saying, hey, just want to remind you of the policy? Does it fall on deaf ears, or do people actually respond to? Um, I haven't received anything specific, but I have to be fair, the, the same time that that was all getting responded to, we were getting more and more guidance. So we got inundated with like, are you opening playgrounds? What does this mean? Uh, right. It was a lot of messaging back and forth, but um, I, I can reach out to them again. And again, if you guys see anything, um, please just um, forward it to me. You can do that. I think if we're friends on Facebook, you can. Yes. Well, if you see something, say something. Oh, boy. Wonderful. Everyone. All right. All right. Anything else in regards to any of the discussion items? Matt is raising his hand. Yeah, you Master guys haven't been paying attention. I've been quiet so long. I, <laughs> We're not used to it. There's a first. Yep. Oh. I, I know we talked earlier in another meeting when we had a group who was doing, wanted to use the fields for yoga. Um, we also have a situation where our young people are not getting jobs because like we are struggling with camps and programs, those camps and programs are closed. Um, I understand the liability issue here, but I also understand that people are not gonna always listen and they're gonna do things because the, you know, they're young enterprising folks trying to make a buck and they've got some skills or whatever. 
So I, I agree that it's not our policy. I agree that there's liability issues, um, but I, and I have also seen a ton of posts and requests and things of that nature. But, you know, I, I also would question, although I don't want to get into it at 10 o'clock at night, we've had a long meeting already, but, you know, it is worthwhile rethinking some of this in light of our current situation because of, you know, we have a number of college and high school students that do not have job opportunities as they would have in the past. And um, they're really just trying to, to make a couple of bucks or stay out of trouble. So we should be taking a look at some of that as well. Because we, as far as I know, we also don't have field permits for youth sports, right? But, um, you know, and that's coming uh, at some point, which would be an item for a future agenda for me. But um, it's just something I think we as a commission need to revisit and take a look at. Nope, all, all valid points. All right. Anything else in regards to any discussion item left? All right. No hands up. Got it. All right, let's go on to the only action item that we have, and it is the minutes of the meeting from, I think, March 30th. Now, Matt, you are not at that meeting, and Bruce, you are not sworn in yet, so that only leaves myself and Michelle and Cindy to vote on this. Um, Matt couldn't vote even if he was at the meeting. You, you, you cut me off. I was going to say that, too. What? All right. Any, uh, any discussion, oh, actually, let's take a look at the notes. Have we all looked through them? Or are there any questions, comments, concerns? No, I, I would make a motion we accept the minutes. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a second by Michelle. Uh, any further comment in regards to the minutes of the meeting of March 30th? I, I would like to thank Chris for getting these minutes done. I know it's not so simple, so th thank you. I'm gonna do better, Cindy, just for you. I, I, I know, and, and I appreciate it. I wanna say five pages, that's gonna be a record. Um, when you record, when you have a recording, um, you can't summarize necessarily as much as other times, so. It's a little more, it's probably a little more detailed um, than general, but. Oh, it's great. I think it's great. We also so. have very, very big conversations about very big things right now. And that was our first meeting after COVID struck. So. Got it. Sure. All right. Very good. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further comment? All right. Seeing none, we will bring it to a vote. Uh, Cindy Chaston. Aye. Michelle Geddes. Thumbs up. That's an aye. Uh, the chair is also uh, an aye, so the minutes of the meeting of March 30th pass unanimously. Uh, let me scroll back up to the top. Uh, I, issues not recently anticipated by the chair within 48 hours. Um, I don't have any. Are there any other opens? Okay, Stacy. Um, Chris, can you move? Or Cindy, somebody's getting feedback. Um, the only thing I would like to bring up by both items six and seven, it, things not anticipated and topics for future agenda is the subject of playground reopening. Um, I think it is going to be long. It is going to be another long conversation. I would like to request that we keep them closed until the next meeting and we discuss um, our protocols as far as the maintenance and cleaning of said high touch areas um, at a future meeting. I agree. Now, do we also have set up, uh, since we're talking about future meetings, can we get the next four on the calendar, please? If we haven't already, that with it being the ninth, our next scheduled meeting will be Monday, June 22nd. And then after that would be Monday, July 6th. Followed again by Monday, July 20th. So the commission usually meets on the second and the fourth Mondays of the month, which would put us at July 13th and July 27th. Uh, I am fine with that then. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. So yes, we will do the 13th and the 27th for the July. 
And then August, that would put us at the 10th and the 24th. Correct. All right. We will set those meetings up right uh, right now as dates of the next meeting. So just to confirm, uh, 622, 713, 727, 810, and 824. Correct. Thank you. I will set those up. I will make sure the links are secure. And what we will also do, and uh, we will reorganize the Park and Rec Commission on the July, uh, the June twenty second, or the July thirteenth meeting. What do we think? Space bar, Cindy. I gotta hit the mute button. Unmute. I think the later the better. I'm happy to have you stay in as long as possible. December thirty first. Is that the I one? I knew you were gonna say that, Cindy. Over. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, Chris, we will. To, to, to May of 2021. We will reorg on Monday, July 13th. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Oh, Any... I, 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 one thing. Yes. One, um, I would just like to um, thank Mr. Tulin for agreeing to serve another year. He was officially appointed tonight as um, Michelle and Chris and, and Matt and I know, and I think Stacy, you might have watched that the board of selectmen meeting. So Matt was reappointed for um, another year, and we are very happy to have him. Um, Bruce, for your information, Matt was scheduled to go off of the commission, and he agreed to stay on one additional year to fill out um, a term that was left open um, when Mr. Tichico passed away. So we are very appreciative that. Matt is staying one year beyond um, what he thought was his expiration date. So thank you, Matt. Expiration date. It is my expiration date. It's the high pay, Cindy. It's yes. the high pay. Uh, ah. God bless you. God bless you, Matt. I'm just waiting for the parade that the select board is going to throw you uh, after that uh, nice introduction that they had during that. I oh mean, my God, that was Matt, crazy. Put it in your diary. June 9th is Matt Toolin Day for the town of Needham. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, I have a moved and a second. Second. Michelle, all right, all those in favor, Cindy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. I am also an aye, so thank everybody very much. I know it was a long meeting, but we had some great stuff to go over, so thank you all for taking the extra time tonight. And Bruce, welcome. Uh, hopefully, when nice next time you all. we have you, you will be officially sworn in. Someday it'll be face. You know. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll yeah, welcome, Bruce. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll Thank get, you also, we'll Matt. This. We will. All right, take yeah. care. All right, good night. Good night.